Where oh where is pretty little Susie? Where oh where is pretty little Susie? Where oh where is pretty little Susie? Way down yonder in the pop pop patch, picking up pawpaws, putting them in her pockets, picking up pawpaws, putting them in her pockets, picking up pawpaws, putting them in her pockets. Way down yonder in the pop pop patch. Come on boys, let's go find her. Come on boys, let's go find her. Come on boys, let's go find her. Way down yonder in the pop pop patch, picking up pawpaws, putting them in her pockets, picking up pawpaws. Putting them in her pockets, picking up pawpaws, putting them in her pockets, way down yonder in the pop pop patch. Where oh where is pretty little Susie? Where oh where is pretty little Susie? Where oh where is pretty little Susie? Way down yonder in the pop pop patch. We're in Clemson, South Carolina at the Musser Fruit Farm, which is one of the experimental properties of Clemson Extension. And I'm speaking with Dr. Greg Riegerd, who's a professor in the Department of Plant and Environmental Sciences. Greg, I am so excited because this is a plant I really wanted to learn about. And for several reasons, um, I want to taste one, but also this is a native plant, and we're talking about the pawpaw. Tell me a little bit about the history of it. Oh yes, pawpaw is one of our few native fruits. You know, we are used to eating apples, peaches, but they're from other continents. The pawpaw has been around a long time. The original settlers used it as one of their uh, a source of fruit that gave them a very uh, high, very high in carbohydrates, um, vitamins, uh, vitamin C, I believe, and it was actually a special uh, fruit that you probably heard the uh, pawpaw patch and what have you. And before we had uh, refrigeration and shipping um, fruits from other parts of the country, it was a very valuable fruit for the settlers. In fact, at the turn of the century, the, the previous century, 1900s, there was contests who could find the largest pawpaw and also the best tasting pawpaw, and they were exhibited at county fairs because it had that high esteem in versus apples and peaches, which today is, are important. Well, why did it fall out of favor? A uh, number of reasons. One, it was very difficult to uh, ship anywhere. You, you have to eat it within a day or two. There was no refrigeration back in the 1800s that was effective. So it didn't last long, so that was the, main, the, pri the primary reason. And then and once we got refrigeration and better transportation, people could get oranges, bananas, tropical fruits from elsewhere, and, and they're easier to handle because, uh, as you'll see later, pawpaw bruises very easily. And it's more, once again, post-harvest and, uh, and other fruits took, took the place of it. Most fruit trees require full sun, but I believe the pawpaw is actually kind of a edge of the forest. Is that kind of the best location for it? Yes, or it could be edge of the forest or edge of a river, but it also grows in the understory and uh, it can tolerate shade, but it doesn't flower very well where you have shade. Well, it has a peculiar flower. I must yes. say the color's peculiar and I think the insects that attracts are peculiar. Can you describe the flower and tell us how it operates? Yes, well the flower is a maroon color. It's a, quite, a fairly large flower um, and it's a very primitive type flower and it uses insects, or uses, excuse me, beetles, night beetles that will do the pollination. Now bottle flies are also thought to pollinate it during the daytime. And, but for many years, people didn't know that. So. There's a funny story about people who used to put roadkill on them. What was the, what was the basis of that? Well, Corin Davis uh, was the first one to try to commercialize this in modern times, in the 60s and 70s. And I happened to be at Michigan when he did that. And you would go to his little orchard, and he would get roadkill animals and hang in the trees. And it would attract these green bottle flies. And he felt that's what gave him good pollination. So, so he always uh, recommended roadkill as your uh, attractant for the, the pollinators. Getting them pollinated is a little bit different though because the flower is perfect as I understand, but the male and female parts are not yes, compatible or ripe at the same time. They are not, you know, the, the stigmas are not receptive at the same time that the pollen's released on the same tree. So um, commercially, um, pawpaws aren't really grown, but a, a related species, the cherimoya and the atomoya, especially the atomoya, are hand pollinated. Now, another interesting aspect is you have the same kind of situation, I think it's described as like hands, where you just get this massive amount of fruit coming from one flower. How do you handle that? Well, because it's not commercially grown per se, most people don't thin them. You can thin those clusters. Um, we'll show you some clusters where I think I have one, there's 12, <laughs> but normally you get two or three and two or three will give you a, up to half pound or even a pound fruit. We've had as many as 
a fruit that was two pounds where it was just a single one. It, it depends partly on genetics and partly on how many fruit clusters are on the tree. And, and then if you do thin them, which I don't know of anyone that does do thinning because pollination is still a little bit of a niffy thing. If people want to plant pawpaws, sometimes they try to go out and dig them up. That, you said, is not a good idea. You need to try to order them from a place and get ones that are specific for your part of the country because it has such a big range it grows in. It has a huge range. It's from uh, um, the Niagara Peninsula in um, Ontario and, su and southern Michigan all the way down to northern Florida. Wow. It's all the way west to eastern Oklahoma and Kansas and all the way in the northeast into parts of New York. And yes, they have different showing requirements. What sort of soil does it take? If I got two containers, you know, because I want two different cultivars so I can get the cross-pollination, mm -hmm. how would I go about installing them in my garden? Well, first of all, some nurseries sell seedlings, bare root seedlings, I don't recommend that. They're hard to establish. The root system is very primitive. It needs mycorrhiza. So if you have a potted or a containerized one, you hopefully the root system has somehow got some of that particular mycorrhiza. If not, when you plant, you want a rich soil that has a lot of organic matter, where you can add leaf litter from a forest, and that will hopefully incorporate the, the fungi for the mycorrhizal association but never go out and dig one out in the forest because you're digging usually these uh, root suckers and they will never, they don't transplant well at all. How many years before they come into production? Well, once again, I say don't pick them in the wild or don't dig them in the wild because those are, they will take uh, seven, eight years. If you have a grafted one, they produce flowers within a year or two. My goodness, I don't have to wait long, do I? Well, I would, you need to wait till they're about six feet tall because okay. they won't hold fruit till they look that tall. There are a lot of things that I'm not going to try to grow because I can't be out there spraying every whip yeah. stitch. Am I going to have a lot of insect pests that I have to deal with? With Paul, you, you don't have many insect pests and one of them you really like is that uh, would like to have. It doesn't do much damage to the whole tree and that's the zebra uh, swallowtail. It, its only host is the pawpaw. As far as uh, fungi, there is a thing called phyllosticta and it does damage the leaves and it does damage the fruit. Um, so in addition to having a pretty pest and disease free tree relatively once mm -hmm. I get it started. Yes. This is going to give me a wonderful unusual fruit that I can do lots of stuff with. Um, I think I even get a little bit of benefit in the fall. Yes it has a beautiful fall coloration. It's a, a deep yellow. Um, it, it's, it's quite and even in the summer the leaves are very um, obovate but they're, they're dark green. They have a more of a tropical a sheen or a look to them. So they're very nice ornamental other than the suckers. They do sucker that would have to be taken care of by mowing. Um, and the fruit is many different flavors. If people want to know more about pawpaws, is there a good place to go to look, look for information? Oh yes, yeah. so the Clemson has the fact sheet, and then if, uh, there's a website if you go to Kentucky uh, State, not University of Kentucky, but Kentucky State University, that is where all the pawpaw research is going on. They have a great website, they have um, bu pamphlets, bulletins on cooking, how to grow them, all the new cultivars. Excellent site for the most recent information. Well, one thing they don't have at Kentucky that we've got right here today is some that are already picked, ready for us to enjoy. Let's go over there and taste some of them. I think that's a great idea, Amanda. Let's go. We've got this basket here, and you wanted ones that gave a little bit, and then you just kind of twisted them off. Is that correct? Yeah, let's give an example. Um, you first, you want to put an imprint. If it'll give you an imprint, it's ready to go. And because it has a wet scar, you don't want to yank because that'll rip the skin. You just give it a twist and it'll come off and minimize leave, the, minimize the, the what we call wound. the wet scar. Okay, yeah. great. Okay. And then you're ready to go with it. Well, how do you cut it? Okay, well, Lengthwise, crosswise? Well, the best way to do it is you, you want to eat it. It's like a pudding custard. So you want to eat it like a cup of pudding. Oh. And so the skin is rigid enough that you can use it as the container. Okay. So um, I have one here. I normally cut it right in the middle. What we end up with You'll see some dark here. These are see, there's a row of seeds that, that are lined this way. They're, they're very smooth. They're easy to spit out if no one's around. <laughs> but if you're with somebody, you, you just have to gently take them out or you, can eat, or you can dig around them. You have a spoon there. I do, thank you. And it's sort of a custard. There's different And I don't flavors. want to eat the skin because it don't has some... Don't eat the some... skin. It has an emetic in it. It was the original epicac. I don't want any of that. Okay. Okay. Well, it comes out very easily. Mmm. Mm, 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 mm. What a complex, fun flavor. This is PA Gold, and it was selected more than 100 years ago mm. from a wild tree. And um, it's uh, more of a dark, uh, it's more of a dark yellow. There are some that are much, um, if I have one here, 
like I do. This is a little bit harder to tell, but some are more of a whitish. Mm -hmm. Usually the yellows uh, taste much better. At least so it this seems one to tastes taste delicious. It's a very, it's a favorite, and uh, it has reasonably good size. We actually have varieties that are bigger than that, but mm. but, that, but that's a good size there. You know, and they say a cross, but but it, to me it has its own flavor. I don't really feel. I feel like it's distinct. It's very distinct. Uh, people, some are called mango, some are called mm -hmm. pineapple. They have hints of those type of things. More of a mango, if I had to. Yeah, and, uh, this call particular it one something. does. Um, uh, this one here is 1032. It's not been released. I had cut it previously. Um, this one's a more milder than that one. In fact, most people pro not most, but if you're not if you're afraid of the Paul Paul, try try <laughs> try the milder one, and then maybe you'll go to the one that has much more rich well, taste. If you eat, live in South Carolina, eat shrimp and oysters, I don't see how you could be worried about this. Do you? Yeah, I don't yeah. see either. Well, let me have that, that that one. Taste another flavor. Okay. Yes. Thank you. It's a different flavor than the one you had. There's probably at least five distinct flavors that I could. Mm, this is one. very different. It's very different. Yeah. yeah. And so um, uh, what we've tried to do is select for ones that are fat and plump versus ones that are more like a kidney bean. Uh -huh. The kidney bean ones are usually the mm. wild types and they're very, uh, they don't get big as this one has not mm -hmm. gotten big because this is a collection of some of the varieties behind us. But we, we want the plumpness so we have uh, a lot more flesh obviously. So, so that's what they've done over the years. I think I mentioned about 100 years ago, they had at county fairs, which had the biggest fruit yeah, and, and the plumpest. Yeah. So, and and lot, it's, it's, there's a mm. lot of potential with this particular crop. You said nowadays people are making ice cream, and I could see that this would just be a bomb with ice cream. Since it doesn't keep well, that was one of the problems, what to use it for. They have found that it makes tremendously good custard desserts mm. and ice cream. Mm -hmm. Ice cream is, uh, they've developed methods, uh, Kentucky State has ways to you could process to get the seeds out yeah. and, and not to get the skin and, and freeze it and use it for uh, ice cream. And so if you that go, way you can stabilize it. Exactly. Yeah. If you go to any pawpaw festival, they have one in Ohio, they have one in Kentucky, they have one in Illinois, and they have one in Indiana, and they always have ice cream. Well, let's try to have one here one day. Have that. That'd, that'd be a great idea. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Where a where is pretty little Susie way down yonder in the pawpaw patch.